Welcome to uh, Los Angeles. And my name is Stephen Moore. I'm the vice chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, before we get started, we want to thank Metropolitan Water District for allowing us to use this facility for the State Water Board meeting and hearing. And also acknowledge and thank the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board because we uh, associate this room with a lot of their activity as well. And, and thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order, obviously, and begin by introducing my colleagues. Over here to my left is Board Member Doreen Diadamo and Board Member Joaquin Esquivel. Board Member Tam Dodick will be joining us shortly. And uh, Chair Marcus is away on personal uh, reason for personal reasons. So from there, I'd like to ask our Executive Director, Ms. Sobeck, to please introduce staff. Um, thank you, um, Vice Chair Moore. Um, I'd like to introduce um, on my left, Chief Counsel Michael Laufer. On my right, my two Chief Deputies, Jonathan Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer. And we have assisting us um, Janine Townsend, clerk to the board today, and assisting her is Courtney Tyler. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to remind folks that this meeting is being webcasted and recorded, so please speak directly into the microphone when you're up to, to make comments, uh, and not too close and not too far, and make sure the microphone's on. And certainly an important item is to make sure all cell phones are turned off of the beep or the, the ringing mode uh, into something that's more of like a stun or vibrate. Yeah. Thank you very much. So with that done, we'd like to move on to the public forum. And our public forum is when we can hear from you about any item that's not on the agenda or a matter that's pending before the board. So do we have any uh, requests for public forum here? I don't have the, the names. Yes, this is a little bit more of a hike than we're used to. Thanks so much, Jean. Okay, oh, very good, okay. So um, we've got some speaker, we have three speakers that want to speak to the subject of the CESPE, um, or CESPE aquifer exemption. First, I would like to ask Ann Olenkamp to come up to the microphone. Ms. Olenkamp, and following Ms. Olenkamp will be Lynn Edmonds, and then Chris Olenkamp. And do we have a timer set? Usually five minutes for public forum. Welcome. San Olin Camp. I live in Fillmore, California, which is a mile from the Sespe Subbasin Aquifer. And Seneca Oil is asking for an exemption. The Sespe Subbasin Aquifer, Seneca Oil is drilling through our water supply. There is only one water supply to the city of Fillmore. And this is where they're going to, they are asking for an exemption because they are putting toxic water that comes from the processing of the oil and bringing it back through the water that goes to Fillmore and then it goes back into where they extracted the oil. Old wells and pipes will eventually break and release the toxins into the layers above the nearly impermeable layers that provide a barrier and flow into the Fillmore subbasin. This is a quote from the application for exemption. It says, these rocks are nearly imparentable, except for the slightly imparable sandstone within fracture zones. It's nearly and almost. This is our only water supply. Fillmore is a small town, about 15,000 people, only one water supply. If this becomes contaminated with toxins, we don't have any, any choices there. So I'm asking, I am opposed to the exemption and I'm asking for you to oppose the exemption. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comments. Ms. Edmonds, please uh, approach the microphone. My name is Lynn Edmonds, and I am the executive director emeritus of a teen program in Fillmore called One Step All of Us. And um, if you haven't been to Fillmore, and very few people have been to Fillmore, uh, we are between Magic Mountain and Ventura on Highway 126. Even though we're an hour from LA and your wonderful traffic that we experienced this morning, um, we are a very isolated community because we have very poor transportation. And we're a fragile community. We have um, continual risk of fires. I look out my front door and I see the hills of Los Padres National Park. Right behind those hills are all the oil fields. Also my favorite hiking area. Um, we're fragile in many, many ways. We're fragile economically. It's a 80% Latina, low-income community, Latino, low-income community. And um, the fires, earthquakes, mudslides, all affect us. We only have one road in and out, so we're isolated when that happens. We live in peril, and the water is our main source of comfort in that we have a secure aquifer that we can count on to provide us with water. We're very careful about the drought. You know, we're very cautious about that, but we have an excellent aquifer. We do not want that in any way damaged. Um, we consider it a racial injustice that uh, low-income minority communities are often targeted for um, pollutants because most low-income minority populations don't complain. And uh, we just got the Superfund toxic waste site cleaned up. Um, we're asking that we not have any possibility. And I know I, we're asking that you reconsider the approval of the um, toxic waste, I mean, of the aquifer. And um, that you write a letter suggesting that you do not approve of that. So we would request that of you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And we have one more commenter on this item, Chris Olenkamp. Welcome. And welcome, board member Doug. Good morning. My name is Chris Olenkamp, and you may recall my name from four or five years ago when I came to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board after the Army Corps of Engineers bulldozed 48 acres in the Wildlife Reserve in the Sepulveda Basin. Uh, and that board was uh, very helpful in um, bringing the core to their senses, even though the core has never done any mitigation or developed another plan since then. But nevertheless, uh, we're coming to you now because my understanding is that you either have been requested or will be requested to sign off on this application proposal. Um, and it is the only source of water for the Fillmore residents. All of our water is well water. So it's very important to us. Um, you know, so let's, let's start with the quote that my wife started with, um, that these rocks are nearly impermeable, except for the slightly impermeable sandstones and within fracture zones. To me, that means it's not impermeable. I mean, even the part that is nearly impermeable is not impermeable. And then what about the sandstones? How much sandstone is there? And how many fracture zones are there? None of that is in the application or the, the materials with the application. I think we need to know that. Um, another quote, this, will, this aquifer will not in the future serve as a source of drinking water because it is hydrocarbon producing. That's the aquifer that they're drilling from. That's the aquifer that is the ex existing exemption zone. But that, that aquifer will not be a source of drinking water unless it goes downhill, downgrade, into the Fillmore subbasin aquifer. And that's what we're afraid of. And that's what we think will definitely happen 
sometime in the future, maybe not 10 years from now, maybe not 30 years from now, but I would be willing to bet that it will happen within 100 years because oil wells crack, pipes crack, and these are carcinogenic materials and radioactive nucleides that are in this water that is extracted from the oil and it's not being treated and they want to inject it back down into the ground. And they've already drilled four injection wells outside of the existing exemption zone. That's why they want this application to extend the exemption zone, make it more than twice as big as it is now, so that their existing wells that, they have, been, that have been closed down temporarily will, can go back into operation. There is no evidence to prove that the aquifer has changed or that those impermeable barriers have changed. So how can they justify doubling the size of this exemption zone? So there are, there are just so many questions. Um, at the hearing before Dogger, the Department of Gas and Geothermal Energy Resources, last week or two weeks ago, um, they were putting a big emphasis on when they're, in, when they're pumping the water out, it creates negative pressure. The quote was, there is negative pressure from the injection wells towards the producing wells, drawing the injection fluid away from Fillmore. Well, <laughs> That's true as long as those producing wells are drawing water out. And I don't think that that negative pressure is going, is significant, certainly not uh, going to overrule the gravity that is gonna draw it down towards Fillmore. So that's a spurious comment. Um, Future earthquakes can also rupture these wells and can rupture this impermeable barrier that's supposed to save Fillmore. Uh, and it's well known that drawing water, producing oil, from, drawing water out of the ground and more often injecting water into the ground can create more earthquakes. So you're, it's inevitable that it's gonna happen. Uh, it's not a matter of whether or not it will, it's just a matter of how, when it will happen. And, and furthermore, the purpose of the entire proposal must be examined because uh, of the fact that they're only doing this to cover up their, their, their mistakes. So, that, you know, you're gonna, we ask you not to reward them for their illegal activities. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, and thanks to the speakers for bringing this issue uh, to our attention. And I'm actually, actually familiar with the area. My father lived in Santa Paula for almost 20 years, so I know Fillmore uh, in that area. So I'd like to actually ask our Chief Deputy Director, uh, John Bishop, who's been involved with the SB4 implementation and, and the oil and gas regulation issues, um, to maybe respond, you know, I, I'm familiar with this aquifer exemption process. It's supposed to be a very public process. The regional board is supposed to be involved. Dogger is involved. We're involved. But um, could could you provide a response about where we're at in this process and uh, provide these folks um, information on how they can uh, be involved in this process? So I, I think they're actually um, right in the middle of the process. They had a hearing. There's a public comment period for folks to bring their issues related to concerns related to the Oxford exemption. I think that they gave a, a pretty accurate description that the, um, my recollection, I don't have the notes in front of me, so I'm a little off, is that on the CESB they've got, um, they're drilling through the, um, the um, drinking water aquifer. The oil is in the aquifer below that. It's, a very usual situation with oil drilling. It's usually deeper down. And um, the, they have an existing exemption for disposal into that lower aquifer. The proposal that is in front of um, Dogger that we will uh, um, need to concur, we've given a preliminary concurrence, but we have a final concurrence, um, would expand the geographic area of that exemption. Um, the um, ongoing operations today are um, injecting into to both the exempted area and as was rightly pointed out that um, that there are 
ejection wells outside of the exempted area that's the reason that we are going through this process of looking at all of these exemptions good so yes the really the issue at hand is the expansion of an existing exempted area and doing a thorough careful um, risk assessment of, of that proposal and and making a determination that dogger will uh, adhere to that is correct and um and we do review all of the comments and look at all the issues related to that and we have in the past had changes due to the in the aquifer exemption proposals based on comments i don't i haven't read these folks comments yet and um, we haven't seen the comments from dogger yet for this one but that's part of the process very good and it's good to see this process uh, more publicly uh, or the more availability of the, the, um, the decision making agencies uh, to the public and their interests to answer the questions. So thanks to SB4. So thank you for your comments and we encourage your participation in, in these discussions. Would anybody else like to make a public comment? I don't know if we didn't really announce, you know, just put in a blue card necessarily. And if uh, seeing none, uh, we can move on to the next uh, item in our agenda. Uh, item number one, um, we'll consider the minutes from October 17, 2017, and I'd entertain a motion. You hit the little button there. Anybody have a chance to look at them? I did, and I'll move for adoption. Second. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. And the next item is item number two. And, me. So this is on the uncontested calendar, and it'll be taken up, taken up and voted on unless uh, we have any discussion from fellow board members or comments. Um, no blue cards. And so I'll entertain a motion for item number two. Move Oh, second. And thanks very much. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, and thanks for the work on that. I think we learned our lesson that uh, we need more than a million dollars to do planning for groundwater grants. And so with that, uh, Ms. Sobeck, could you please introduce item number three? Um, so item number three, we're, this is an informational item, um, and we're going to receive our... Um, our normal um, report on current hydrological um, conditions. And who is doing that for us? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Jack Safely, please. Thank you. And uh, Colorado River, and then some of the local supply activities that we have going. First, just a little bit of background on Metropolitan. We're here on the southern coastal plain, and we serve uh, nearly 19 million people in our service area. We cover about 5,200 square miles, and we have 26 member agencies. We are a water wholesaler. And at the retail level, our demands are about 4 million acre feet of water each year, and half of that roughly is supplied by imported water and half by local supplies in our area. We get our imported water from two watersheds here. You'll see in the, on the left in Northern California, the State Water Project. And then on the right, the Colorado River, the seven states there that receive water from the Colorado River. Uh, some highlights just from the last water year, if we look in California, our snowpack um, last water year was above average, the long-term average. We got, uh, in terms of water content, about 44 inches of water. That's about 50% higher than the long-term average that we see. And rainfall, uh, we all know, was uh, a record setter last year, record-breaking rainfall. We broke the old record by about six inches, um, caused a few problems in Northern California. Uh, but it did result in record runoff for us as well. Looking at the Sac Valley Index, uh, that broke the record nearly 40 million acre feet in runoff uh, for the year. So all that water resulted in an 85% state water project allocation for us. That's the highest that the state water contractors have had since 2006. In that year, there was 100% allocation. 
And we've had some very low ones in between, but uh, we're back to uh, good supply in the current fiscal uh, water year. Let's turn our attention to the Colorado River Basin. Some of the same stats, uh, above average snowpack, rainfall, and runoff in the Colorado River watershed. And there are two main reservoirs there, Lake Powell and, and Lake Mead. And one of the encouraging things that we're seeing there, if you look at the last four years or so, we're seeing a trend up in storage. So that's uh, good for us. So Colorado's been in a long-term uh, drought over 15 years where we've seen uh, low rainfall and, and runoff with a, a couple of uh, above normal years in there. But uh, this is an, an encouraging trend for us in Lake Powell. If we go to Lake Mead, you can see that we've had uh, some low levels there since 2012, and we're skirting on the storage levels for shortage triggers uh, on the Colorado River. But fortunately, if you look at just this last year, we're bumping up just a little bit, so we're hopeful that maybe we'll turn the tide there. Uh, and a lot of activities are taking place now uh, in, in the Colorado watershed for conservation, and the states are working together to try and keep water levels up in Lake Mead and avoid those shortages. In our case, if you look at our water supply in 2017, we've got nearly a million acre feet of Colorado River supplies available to us and with an 85% allocation from the state. That's 1.6 million acre feet of, of water. We've also received some transfers and exchanges and uh, during the winter, we were able to take some surplus water from the state project. It's called Article 21 water, nearly 120,000 acre feet. So our total supply for this year is 2.75 million acre feet, and that outstrips our demand of uh, 1.45 million acre feet. So we've got a pretty good chunk of water that we have to manage this year, nearly 1.3 million acre feet that's available to us. So one of the things that we've been doing over the years is expanding storage uh, through many programs uh, throughout the state. And I'll just run through them clockwise from the top, carryover storage in San Luis Reservoir, groundwater storage in the Central Valley uh, with a number of water agencies that we partner with. In Lake Mead, we have the intentionally created surplus storage and exchanges with desert and Coachella water districts. And within our service area, we have conjunctive use programs and cyclic storage. There's no water in those currently because we drew those down during the drought. Flexible storage in uh, Lake Paris and Castaic Lake and our, our own surface storage within our region. So we began this year with about 1.3 million acre feet in storage. And we're adding about a million acre feet uh, over this calendar year, the biggest chunk going into Lake Mead, about 350,000 acre feet. And those blue numbers show the volumes going into the other programs. So that really helps us out. And in terms of our main storage reservoir here, you can see during the drought, we drew that down to its record low storage, uh, but we're going to end up this year over 700,000 acre feet of its 810 acre, uh, thousand acre foot capacity. Over time, if you look at how we've managed through droughts and wet periods, this graphic shows storage levels uh, in our programs. You can see we started out uh, and built up storage in the early 2000s. Uh, prior to the, that first drought period you see there, we had 2.2 million acre feet in storage. Uh, drew that down, refilled again to 2.7 million acre feet. And this last drought, we drew heavily on that storage. We're on the rebound again, uh, putting about a million acre feet back into storage. And that will get us about to the 2013 level that we were at and getting our reserves back up. We've also invested heavily in local resources, uh, water recycling, groundwater recovery, and conservation. You can see here, uh, since 1982, we've uh, encouraged over 2.5 million acre feet of recycled water production. And this year, we'll produce about uh, 450,000 acre feet of recycled water. And to achieve that yield, we've invested quite a bit of money since 1982, nearly $450 million. Also on groundwater sorry, recovery. Sorry to interrupt. Um, can, can I ask a question and go back one? Go back one? Sure. Uh, does, what does LRP stand for? I'm sorry, that's Local Resources Program, and that's how we encourage our uh, member agencies to develop water and, and fund and, uh, provide and then, incentive funding. And then non LRP would be? Those would be projects that were done solely by an agency without uh, assistance from Metropolitan. Uh -huh. 
So you, know, you add those up, that's our total production. Good, good. So that's the yeah, Metropolitan's invested is the color. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, groundwater recovery uh, recovers water that's impaired or, or poor quality. We provide funding uh, to develop groundwater desalters and similar projects. And these are also part of the local resources program. Our agencies also do that on their own. Uh, this year, about 90,000 acre feet of water will be produced from those programs. And we've invested about $150 million over the, the life of this program to make sure that those supplies are reliable. And finally, our conservation credits program. Uh, you know, the last couple of years, you've heard about our turf uh, replacement program. We spent a lot of money on that, uh, about, about $450 million. Uh, that's the single biggest chunk out of all of our conservation ex uh, expenditures. We encourage uh, a number of programs, and this year we're estimating our savings to be about 200,000 acre feet annually, so a significant uh, amount of water is saved. And all these programs help keep our water supply reliable and um, meeting our customers' needs. So this year, we've had a slow start to the water year. This is a precipitation in October. You can see it looks pretty grim, uh, but October is just the first month. Um, so we're hoping for an improvement there. We got a little over an inch and a half of rain in the uh, northern Sierra, and uh, that should be starting to improve. If you look at the longer term projections that NOAA has on uh, outlooks, there's about an even chance of average precipitation over the next three months. Uh, and possibly a little bit wetter in the northern parts of the Colorado watershed. So looking ahead, what do we see? Uh, this year we're going to have a record amount of water put into storage in our area, over a million acre feet. That's the most we've done um, to date. And going ahead into next year, I, I think last year showed us how variable it can be. We've had a slow start. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see what develops on the state project in Northern California. That rain is highly variable. Um, and there are some conditions, you know, with Lake Oroville, the flood control pool being changed, that could affect uh, how water is allocated under certain conditions, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, we did get above average runoff in the Colorado River system, so that's reduced the likelihood of shortages there. We see the storage increases in Lake Powell and Lake Mead, so um, the next couple of years look pretty good as far as shortage triggers are concerned. And we will continue aggressively with our conservation program. We're uh, very supportive of that. If you look at the long-term uh, outlooks, too, their uh, discussions on El Nino and La Nina, they're saying it's uh, going towards La Nina, uh, which could mean a typical pattern wetter in the Pacific Northwest, maybe a little drier here in Southern California. But uh, again, these are really variable, so we like to see how they play out. And that concludes my presentation. If there's time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We appreciate uh, Metropolitan volunteering to give us a hydro hydrology report and uh, is very informative. Any questions or comments from fellow board members? Well, thanks for that preparation. I, uh, one question I had, um, you had a uh, term on an earlier uh, graphic that said current demand trend and you show the difference between that surplus this year and the demand trend. Are you modifying your assumptions on demand based on the last couple of years of per capita use, or are you still using more conservative estimates for demand? Our, our current trend is based on what's happening now, so they would be with a lower uh, per capita use. We also bound that with a high and a, and a low end for our planning purposes, but we, that's where we're projecting that we would come in. That's always interesting to hear and, and, and good to hear that um, the regional wholesalers and the local agencies, when they're using more current demand information to plan, um, that enables more flexibility for all the host of beneficial uses out there. So we appreciate that. All right. Well, thanks very much. And uh, we're going to move along. You know, I, I've noticed that we have some uh, neighbors from the Salton Sea area. And looking at the schedule for today, um, I'm estimating, I don't know exactly, but it might be about an hour and a half or an hour to an hour and a half to do the groundwater item based on the length of the presentation. So there's a very good chance we may take a lunch break before the Salton Sea item. Uh, so I just wanted to, to warn folks, but we'll see how things go and we'll revisit that based on the timing. Okay, and with that, I'd like to go to item number four. Ms. Sobeck, will you please introduce item four on conservation? Um, 
Yes, um, Vice Chair Moore. Um, Eric Ekdahl is going to make our uh, the presentation our um, usual update on the emergency water conservation regulation and. Good morning, is the microphone on? Yes, okay. Good morning, Vice Chair Moore, members of the board. My name is Eric Ekdahl. I'm here to do our regularly scheduled monthly update on urban water conservation. Today I'll be uh, showing the results for September 2017. As a bit of background, this is the 40th month of our urban water conservation regu emergency regulations. Uh, they kicked into effect in June 2014, where we've had kind of a, a fluctuating set of requirements over that time, uh, culminating with the 25% mandatory cutbacks for the statewide urban water use. Uh, in 2016, we stepped back and kind of went to a stress test-based approach, and in April of 2017, uh, the governor formally rescinded the emergency drought proclamation and asked the board to remove the mandatory reductions, but to keep the prohibitions of wasteful water uses in place and to continue the monthly reporting. And I'll touch on both of those in a later slide because those will both expire as of November 25th. In September 2017, we saved collectively as a state about 15%, a little bit under 14.9% relative to September 2017. 97% of suppliers reported. That's a pretty good uh, return rate. And we saved about 31 billion gallons of water, or 96,000 acre feet. That's enough for about 481,000 people. And for comparison, that's about the size of the city of Sacramento. We can see how we've stacked up relative to other years. Uh, 2017 is the orangish reddish line. The dark or rather light blue background is the 2013 baseline. So you can see that this year we're kind of tracking right about in the middle of where we were relative to our pre-drought baseline levels in 2013 compared to 2015, which was when the mandatory cutbacks were in place. So we're, we're tracking right about in the middle, and people seem to have embraced conservation as a way of life. They continue to conserve. They continue to reduce water use. Not quite at the levels that we saw during the peak of the drought, but there are kind of some other extenuating circumstances that likely have driven water use higher, and I'll show those here. Uh, September 2017 was a relatively hot month. You can see the trends. This is September averages departure from the 20th century average. Things have been trending up for a long time. 2017, the entire summer, was the hottest summer on record for the state of California. So we have kind of an interesting dynamic developing where 2016-17 water year was the single wettest record for much of the state, not all of it, uh, yet it's followed immediately by then the hottest summer that we've had on record. Uh, that's kind of continuing a trend that uh, climate scientists have projected for climate change scenarios in California where you would experience hotter summers, hotter temperatures, and continued fluctuations in precipitation extremes, swinging from drought to heavy precipitation over time. It's also been manifested in our snowpack, which I don't have a slide for this, but you know, despite our, our record uh, precipitation, we were nowhere close to record in terms of snowpack. And so that has consequences for how we store water, how we manage water, and how we kind of uh, plan our water resources into the future, whether we're storing water in surface or underground or, or different types of uh, protocols for managing that runoff. Statewide, we were at about 111 RGPCD, that's residential gallons per capita per day. It's a little bit more than last year, 4%, and you can see how we've done statewide. The dark blue bottom bar is 2013 baseline, kind of increasing upwards 2013, 14, 15, 16, so the orange bar is 2017. Uh, you can see the different hydrologic regions across the state. And because we're in uh, the Los Angeles area, we decided to highlight a little bit of the South Coast's conservation efforts. Uh, the kind of highlighted region down at the bottom shows the South Coast region. They were at 99 RGPCD per
for uh, the September 2000 time period. That's a little bit higher than it was last year. Last year they were at 96. But one thing to remember is just because there are so many people in this region, 20 to 25 million, uh, just that three gallon per person per capita per day swings about two to 2.5 billion gallons worth of water. So that, you know, it, it actually amounts to a fairly large chunk of the overall state's water use. You can see how the region has done in terms of RGPCD from June 2014 through 2017 in that upper graph. The gray shaded region shows the extremes, kind of the range that we've seen throughout the state. Uh, the orange bar is the statewide average, and then the blue bar shows the south coast average, and that they've tracked uh, almost uniformly a little bit lower than the statewide average over time, showing, I think, in part the commitment to conservation that we saw in the previous uh, presentation. Just to call out some of the uh, regional suppliers that have uh, been successful, there are 92 uh, urban water suppliers in just the uh, Region 4 Regional Water Quality Control Board. The kind of South Coast hydrologic region that I showed in the previous slide contains 172 of the state's 409 urban water suppliers, so a little less than half. Uh, and we've seen overall a large amount of savings since the urban water conservation regulations kicked in. Uh, you can see the average savings since June 2015 in kind of the middle column, and then the September 2017 RGPCD. I want to point out that, you know, how low some of those numbers are. At 38 gallons per person per day, that not only accounts for indoor water use, but that also accounts for outdoor water use, and that's a tremendously low RGPCD. Uh, Uh, I suspect that in some communities uh, that may or may not be lower income communities that a lot of outdoor water is just stopping entirely. So if you look at kind of just indoor water use, if you have relatively efficient appliances, uh, it's relatively easy to get an RGPCD below 40. Uh, not always, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but when you start watering outdoors, that's when it really starts to pop up. It is a big issue for us. Uh, could you have staff look into that and see if if they're suffering uh, loss of, you know, tree mortality in that community or how they're managing, you know, if they stop outdoor watering on turf? Yes, and that actually, segues nicely into the next slide. There we go. Uh, what are the next steps for the urban water conservation regulations? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the emergency regulations, which we last renewed in February 2017, which was kind of at the height or of our wet water year, we went, weren't quite sure where we were going to end up, but it looked like it was going to turn out to be a great year, and in fact it was. Uh, but we didn't know yet when we renewed these regulations, and so we extended them for another 270-day period, which lasts until November 25th. Throughout that time period, the governor issued two executive orders, one in May 2016, the last in April 2017, uh, when he rescinded the drought that said, or asked for the board to make certain elements of these emergency regulations permanent, including the permanent prohibitions on unreasonable water uses, and the mandatory reporting that we get monthly that we do these updates with. Uh, throughout that time, there have been a number of then legislative efforts. Uh, the reporting component is in active legislation right now. And so for the time being, we're pausing on moving forward with the reporting regulations just to let the legislative process play out. But we are moving forward with the uh, prohibitions on wasteful water uses. And on November 1st, we released a set of documents that describe the draft proposed prohibitions. They're very, very similar to what was prohibited during the emergency regulations. Uh, we have made some minor modifications to them and some minor wording changes, and then we've done some code cleanup, kind of moving things around that don't substantially affect the wording of the regulations themselves. Uh, those are available on our website. 
And we are <coughs> proposing to hold a staff workshop on November 21st in Sacramento as part of the November 21st board meeting. Uh, we have opened up now the formal public comment period. The comments close December 26th, uh, but we'll take kind of comments up through that time and through the November 21st workshop. And at the November 21st workshop, we've teed up a series of questions that we've asked stakeholders to comment on. And I'd like to briefly just mention those here. One is directly regarding kind of how we handle the prohibition of turf in medians. And that was in place during the drought uh, emergency regulations, but looking forward at issues like tree mortality and making sure that we don't have unintended consequences, we're asking stakeholders to propose uh, you know, ways that we can make the wording less uh, likely to result in tree mortality and unintended consequences. We've also asked a couple of questions on how we should handle the uh, hospitality prohibitions, serving water at restaurants without asking, and the uh, prohibition for hotels to launder unless you ask for it. So we're seeking some additional comment. We're hoping to hear from stakeholders at that November 21st meeting. And that concludes the update. Are there Thank any questions? You. Thank you, Mr. Ekdahl. Um, any questions from the board member? I might have you go back. Um, a couple, the slide that has the monthly uh, reporting with the 2013 blue in the background. Yes, this one. This, this slide tells quite a story. I've used it in lectures. Um, and, um, you know, certainly conservation has taken hold in our state. This shows that, you know, along the way we had 1.2 mil million more Californians between the orange line and the light blue polygon. So this is quite a, a number that's been sustained, and thanks to the monthly reporting, we can show the public today, ironclad, that this is happening, thanks to the monthly reporting, which is going to cease soon. So this is quite a story that we were able to tell, thanks to that authority. Um, but I'm curious, too, you know, during the drought, so much leadership at the local level, so much accomplishment, a lot of which was related to detecting and dealing with leaks uh, on both private property and in public water systems. Have we had a chance to uh, query or ask folks, or has Aqua done any estimate on what part of this water savings, this remarkable water savings, is due to stepped up efforts to detect leaks underground that had been going undetected? I can't speak for kind of past efforts during the drought, but I can talk a little bit about what we are doing at the state level to ask or address that very question. Uh, in 2015, there was a, a bill passed, Senate Bill 555, that directed the Department of Water Resources to conduct water loss audits to kind of look at the level of loss over the last few years for these urban water suppliers. And then it further directed the state water board to adopt standards for uh, leaks. So in the next couple of years, we'll be taking the data that DWR collects, which should be coming in soon, I believe, if not already, and kind of working with stakeholders, doing a public process, and then adopting by regulation standards for what's reasonable levels of loss in certain water use systems. And we're reaching out to a, a number of, uh, kind of outside groups who have done significant works on leaks before. Uh, we're working with the American Water Works Association to kind of make sure that the water loss audit data is done the right way and that the data that we get is high quality and useful. And I believe we've uh, contributed about $3 million towards that effort from the state uh, to AWWA to kind of help do those audits. Uh, the data is not yet fully out, but I believe it should be coming out soon and should be publicly available in the next couple of months from DWR. And we'll use that. I think the standards are due by 2021. That's great. I remember when we were setting up the 2015 uh, implementation of the mandatory cuts, we had a, 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 a slogan, I guess. It was, look at lawns, leaks, and low flow. You know, and, and, and this shows the, the concerted effort of all Californians and what we've been able to accomplish and still accomplish even though the drought is officially over. Could you go a little f uh, further on to the, the table from the Los Angeles suppliers? And thanks for the questions, board member Diadamo. This is a, a, a really informative table. It, it shows 
um, that there's not a linear relationship between you know the percent reduction and the residential gallon per capita per day. These are really independent variables, and you have to look at, as board member pointed out, some of the demographic information, as you did, demographic information, um, and 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 how important target setting has to be sensitive. I think to you know this the, the starting point and you know what you're comparing against. So percent reduction doesn't tell the story here. There were communities that were already remarkably efficient um, at the beginning of the drought, and so. That's why the long-term framework, in my opinion, is so important because it takes into account that those type of factors, that there's a water budget aspect moving forward for our state uh, that needs to be sensitive to the, uh, the specific community characteristics. So I just wanted to point that out and thank staff for putting this table together. It's a great illustration of those important principles. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Eckbell. And at this time, uh, we're pleased to invite um, uh, folks uh, to be ready for the, uh, unless we have any comments on that. We didn't get any blue cards, right, on the conservation. I didn't think so. So uh, item number five, where well, we're going to talk about uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power's groundwater remediation program in the San Fernando Valley, which is my hometown. So I care about the water. I care about the water throughout the state, but there pretty important. And um, so, um, Ms. Sobeck, could you introduce staff that are going to be presenting on this item? Um, yes, this is, a, this is an information item, and um, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is in the process of designing and constructing facilities in the San Fernando um, groundwater basin to address legacy contamination, and they're seeking um, Proposition 1 grant funding for this, this effort, so we, we ha can have a panel here. Um, from uh, with staff from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the State Water Board, and the Regional um, Water Board. So I'm going to let folks um, um, introduce themselves here and in the um, and choose the order in which they're going to speak. Megan, are you going to start us off? Oh, Les Leslie um, Loudon, the head of our Division of um, Financial Assistance, is going to um, introduce our panel. There we go. All right. Well, good morning, board members and uh, others in the audience. Um, my name is Leslie Loudon. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Financial Assistance at the State Water Board. And I just wanted to very briefly introduce this item, kind of the purpose of why we're here before Megan introduces the rest of the team on the panel. Um, I do want to thank the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power for assisting us with this presentation. They've been a, a great partner in this whole process. And um, really our purpose here today is to highlight some of the complex and competing benefits and requirements that are involved in these types of really complicated and large-scale groundwater cleanup projects. And LADWP has kind of been, we are talking about this earlier, they're almost a guinea pig in our process because our Prop 1 groundwater program, it's a new program where the State Board has been funding these large-scale groundwater cleanups. And what we realized in doing this is there's a lot of people on the team, there's a lot of considerations as far as the benefits and the requirements of all the various people on the team. And so we felt we wanted to present that to the board to kind of highlight some of the lessons that we've learned working together over the last two years and so that we can kind of share those with other people, other uh, recipients that we have in our Prop 1 program that are doing similar types of, of projects because we think some of these things can be shared broader. So I just wanted to kind of give that as our purpose for being here. Megan's going to go ahead and start uh, the presentation and introduce the panel. Thanks, Megan. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Loudon. And before we get started, Megan, is it worth noting that, you know, certainly this is an important statewide important um, basin, but the discussions leading up to Prop 1, the water bond that the voters approved, really did contemplate some of this enhancing these as this aspect of water storage in our state. Is that not true? 
that this area is significant statewide from a storage standpoint. Right, from a storage and also these, you know, these large basins uh, with, with, you know, widespread contamination can be used as, as a water supply and how we do that with this large scale cleanup. It doesn't seem to be clicking. Okay. So uh, just quickly to run through who the speakers are going to be today, I'm Megan Tosingham with the Division of Financial Assistance, and I'll be giving a brief update on the Prop 1 groundwater funding. Then we have Bill Van Wagner from LADWP, and he'll be giving a background um, just on the San Fernando Basin as a whole and some of the past remediation efforts. And we have Jeff O'Keefe from the Division of Drinking Water. He'll be uh, talking more about the permitting process for domestic use of impaired sources. And then we have Sam Unger from the LA Regional Board, and he'll be giving sort of the regional board perspective of some of the other nearby cleanup efforts and water policy considerations. Should I be pointing at somewhere in particular? <laughs> Okay, sorry. So uh, Prop 1 groundwater, we have uh, 800 million for projects that prevent or clean up groundwater contamination with a focus on um, sources that have served or um, are serving as a source of drinking water. Uh, meanwhile, LEDWP has been working on design and construction of several facilities to address impacts in the San Fernando Basin. So they submitted several applications for our first round of funding and we'll be awarding, or we have awarded, uh, funding to four projects. So the first is the North Hollywood West, uh, it's a pump and treat uh, system and it will, the estimated grant amount is about $46 million for that implementation project. And then we have three planning projects and um, based on the board's action earlier today, those will be eligible for up to a maximum of $2 million per project. Um, and so briefly, I just wanted to touch on this concept of a memorandum of understanding. So in addition to our regular grant agreements that we execute for projects, we're going to be executing an MOU, which will sort of set a framework for a multi-agency technical advisory committee. And that committee will be reviewing project deliverables and tracking project status, um, the idea being to help sort of ensure coordination and balance between LADWP's efforts to increase pumping and also while also um, ensuring that we're considering the potential impacts to nearby cleanup. So um, the MOU will involve the State Water Board, the Regional Water Board, and LADWP. Um, and so you'll hear a little bit more about that throughout the presentation. And now we'll turn it over to Bill. Hi, is the mic Okay. That's that. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to present our San Fernando Basin Groundwater Remediation Program to you today. Next slide. And I'm going to kind of give you an overview, starting with um, some background information and some of the directives that are uh, pushing us towards rapid development of our local water resources. I'll provide some overview on the San Fernando Groundwater Basin and prior remedial efforts. Uh, I'd like to spend a little time talking about our program that we're um, working on right now, as well as next steps. Uh, City of Los Angeles, we have about four, four million customers. Uh, our service area is about 473 square miles. We serve about 550,000 acre feet of water each year and do that with over 7,000 miles of pipes, tanks, reservoirs, pump stations, and treatment facilities to, to pull, pull that off. Next slide, please. Um, in Los Angeles, we have very significant challenges with our water supply. We probably get about 14% of our water supply locally. Most of that is from groundwater, uh, with some from recycled water. Uh, the rest of our water we're importing either through the uh, Colorado River Aqueduct, the Los Angeles Aqueduct, or the State Water Project. And another element that makes our local water uh, supply development so important is every one of these aqueducts happens to cross the San Andreas Fault. So there's a resiliency element to this. Next slide, please. 
Um, there was, there's been a number of directives um, over the last few years, some we've heard about today. Our own mayor uh, has really cracked down on water conservation goals, which we were able to meet, uh, reducing our per capita uh, water use. Um, we were just hearing about the, the, the state level um, orders. And I think very importantly, the Los Angeles' sustainable city plan, there's two really key goals here. One is to reduce the amount of water we're purchasing uh, that's imported from somewhere else by 50% by 2025, and an even loftier goal by 2035 to actually be sourcing half of our water locally. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the ways we're doing this is we're taking a very integrated approach. We've been partnering with the city's Bureau of Sanitation, um, as well as other city departments, looking for ways to, um, you know, major projects coordinate anywhere there's synergy and overlap. And looking at not just drinking water, but stormwater capture, groundwater, recycled water, and wastewater, all is one water in essence. Next, please. Probably some of the biggest components to developing local water supply involve capture of stormwater and percolating into, into the ground. Uh, we were talking about storage earlier. It, storage really is very, very important. Um, and also recharging treated recycled water. Uh, for also for augmenting um, our groundwater supplies. And in order to do this, you absolutely have to have a clean groundwater basin. And that's really the nexus. The remediation of the San Fernando groundwater basin, I think as you'll see, is absolutely key uh, to meeting these local water resource um, development goals. Next, please. The San Fernando groundwater basin is actually one of four groundwater basins in the upper Los Angeles River area watershed. That's a mouthful. Um, you've got the Silmar Basin, the Verdugo Basin, Eagle Rock Basin, and the San Fernando. And on this slide, the San Fernando Basin is, is in the white color. It's in essence the, pretty much the entire valley floor of the San Fernando uh, Valley. Next, please. We have water rights in a number of the basins in the area, but as you can see from this slide, next please. Um, the San Fernando Basin really is key. That's where about 80% of our groundwater rights lie. And our current rights are about 87,000 acre feet per year. So you can see when it comes to developing our local water resources, again, the San Fernando Basin is absolutely key and imperative. Next, please. Uh, we have a number of well fields, some of which I'll be talking about today in the San Fernando Basin, uh, from the Tahunga well field up to the north, the Rinalda Toluca well field, the North Hollywood well field, which has an east and a west branch, and the Pollock well field down in the south. Those are the major well fields we're going to be talking about today. Next, please. Um, there's a long history at this point of remediation efforts. Um, next slide. Beginning in the 1940s, we saw heavy urbanization in the San Fernando uh, Valley, um, including a lot of um, industrial activities, uh, along with you know, non-regulated disposal of chemicals and waste. And as a result, we now have quite a bit of contamination in the basin. Next, please. In 1986, um, the EPA placed four sites in the San Fernando Valley on the national uh, pollute, uh, priority list. Area one is Burbank and North Hollywood. Area two, Glendale and Crystal Springs. Area three, Verdugo. And area four, the Pollock Los Angeles area. And you can also see on that map up there that a lot of our well fields happen to fall within these areas. Next, please. In 1989, uh, the first remediation project went online, and that's the North Hollywood Operable Unit. And that was, in essence, taking water from the east branch of the North Hollywood uh, well field. Next, please. Um, in 1992, there was a, a landmark effort, uh, which was really the first comprehensive uh, remedial investigation of the San Fernando Basin. And um, next slide, please. Uh, in 1999, we brought our second remediation effort online, and this was in the Pollock well field where we had volatile organic compounds that were impacting um, that well field. Next, please. And then in 2009, we implemented what we call our groundwater system improvement study, and which in essence is an update to the original remedial investigation, uh, basically looking for data gaps and to make sure we had an up-to-date data set. Next slide, please. Um, here's a view of some of these remediation efforts. There's the North Hollywood Operable Unit, which is an air stripping tower. And right now, they're, uh, we're working on a 
the, the next interim remedy or the second inter, um, interim remedy for this, we're actually looking at um, utilizing, or we're working with EPA and some of the responsible parties to see if we can utilize our uh, uh, well field infrastructure in a collaborative way that would actually make this, this particular program far more robust, perhaps double the amount of mass moved in the amount of water that's produced. Uh, there's the Pollock operable unit that I mentioned, and it's uh, liquid phase GAC or granular activated carbon towers uh, to remove VOCs in that well field. And then in 2010, we um, put up a, a study at the Tahunga well field, uh, again, um, with GAC, and uh, to see, see what we could learn and also to produce some water. And what we found is, you know, normally we would pump the clean wells first and go to the ones that weren't later. In this case, we had to operate these wells that were connected to this treatment unit around the clock, 24-7. And it was interesting because what we saw is it actually focused the plume on those wells that were in operation. So, you know, whereas going to the cleanest wells, you can see things spread out, this was actually a way to control. And so that's the strategy that we're employing as we move forward with our, our program. So very important lesson from this program. Next slide, please. There's also remediation efforts. Uh, there's the Burbank Operable Unit and the Glendale Operable Unit. Next, please. And despite all these efforts, what we found is, you know, over the years we've lost a lot of our wells. Um, in 1990, we had a total of 115 wells. Uh, keep going. <laughs> One more and stop there. Um, by 2014, we were down to 30 reliable wells out of 115. And so this, in essence, we're watching this, the San Fernando Basin, is in essence, disappear as that key resource that's so important to our local water supply development. Next, please. I notice that they're kind of within the area laterally. Is it because there's a vertical separation? Why you can still have a well in that area where others next to them have been discontinued? It could. I mean, there's, you know, generally the groundwater moves um, sort, of, sort of in a southeasterly direction. And uh, so, you know, a lot of our wells are along that same range. And, and actually everything's on the east side of the valley because of the geology. That's where you've got coarse sands and gravels, which gives you the best water bearing performance. And that's also why all the spreading grounds are also over on the, the east side of the valley. Um, I mentioned earlier our, um, our groundwater system improvement study. Uh, starting in 2009, we embarked on a six-year study to update the information in the basin and get a good up-to-date characterization. During that time, we drilled 26 new monitoring wells to help fill some of the data gaps and collected over 70,000 data points and the, we invested $33.5 million in, in the study, which concluded in 2015. Next, please. So what do things look like? I think these are plume maps as of 2014. This particular one is trichloroethylene, or TCE. And you can see from where our Tahunga well field is, way up north, we've got contamination to the north of that. And it extends downwards well past our Pollock well field down in the south, and in essence, um, you know, source control is not an option in a situation like this. The, the horse is out of the barn so long ago, and it's just spread literally across the eastern half of the San Fernando Basin, again, impacting many of our wells. Next, please. And this is uh, tetrachloroethylene, or PCE. It looks very similar to the, the uh, TCE plume that we were just looking at. It's pretty much widespread and impacted most of our well fields. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the 1,4-dioxane, and this one um, is notable. Uh, you'll notice that we don't have the widespread contamination that we do with the PC and TC. And in particular, if you look sort of halfway up on the left part of the slide there at the, near the North Hollywood uh, area, you'll see a very high concentration of 1,4-dioxane, kind of a localized plume. And it's um, right on top of, our, of the west branch of our North Hollywood well field, which are in yellow dots. And you'll notice that most of the yellow dots go east and west, but there's a few that extend up to the north. That's actually the location of our North Hollywood West project that we'll be talking to you about. And the opportunity is, is that by getting this project going, we're hoping to park this plume in place. Um, and you'll also see that it's flanked on the other side by the Rinaldo Toluca well field in the blue dots up there, light blue dots. 
uh, you know, that's an opportunity we're really focusing on because there's a, you know, we hope to keep that plume from starting to look like the other plumes which have, have gone everywhere. Um, we also have 1,4 dioxane impacting the Tahunga well field. You can sort of see a sliver, knife blade looking uh, plume that's literally broadsiding the well field up there to the north. And then down at the Pollock well field, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's also a plume of 1,4 dioxane that's uh, caused us to shut down some of our Pollock wells as well. Um, the, next slide, uh, please. the differences in the spread of the plumes, is that uh, a function of time and usage, or is it because of any sort of chemical composition reasons? Um, I'm not sure why the 1,4 dioxane hasn't spread like the, the TC and PCE. But you know, I, we're fortunate it's not as widespread, so it's going to be easier to deal with. We'll be able to um, uh, hold the line, so to speak. Um, back to the North Hollywood again. You, you see that we've got the North Hollywood well field to the West Branch, the yellow dots, and then you've got the Ronaldo Toluca wells that are sort of at a diagonal to the right of that and above it. Um, if those wells operate, if we can figure out which key wells um, will intercept the contamination, the contamination uh, will, there will be a capture zone and that contamination will be stopped in its tracks and then pulled out of the ground and removed. And there's, there are some other efforts going on um, as part of the East Branch and um, you know, there are some, some of the responsible parties are doing remediation for 1,4 dioxin over near the East Branch of the North Hollywood well field. But again, that, there's that real hot spot, um, which, which is a big opportunity to try to catch before it spreads. And then you might have a slide on this, but um, uh, overlaying all the different contaminants. It looks like several of them are you know, pretty much in the same area. And, um, First of all, do you have a slide that shows sort of an overlay? I don't have a slide in this deck that shows an overlay. It gets kind of confusing, actually. Mm. So that's why we've done it contaminant by contaminant. But as I get into the projects themselves, you know, I, I will show you which con you know, contaminants, because you're right, we're dealing with multiple contaminants at some of these locations. And so for someone like me that's, that doesn't have a technical uh, background, uh, or chemical, um, anything you can do to comment on uh, remediation where, you know, uh, an action uh, can target several uh, chemicals at the same time would be helpful. Yeah, and, and I will do so. Thank you. Okay, um, next. Oh, we already got the next one. This is hexavalent chromium, and there are some areas in the, in the San Fernando Basin which are affected by hexavalent chromium especially in, a, in and around the Glendale area. You can see some hot spots there. Um, there. There is some hexavalent chromium that's of concern, again, in the east branch of the North Hollywood West well field, and there are responsible parties working on that. And then we're quite concerned down by the Pollock well field, again, down to the south. It's hard to see, uh, but there's a small plume of hexavalent chromium that we're afraid may show up at that well field. Um, at some point in the future, so we're keeping tabs on that. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so because of all this, the remediation program that we're, in, we're moving ahead on, and the overall purpose of the San Fernando Groundwater Basin Remediation Program is to restore and protect the full use of the San Fernando Groundwater Basin as a source of water consistent with LADWP's long-term water rights and historic groundwater use. Next slide, please. And our remedial action objectives are to remediate the basin and maintain the beneficial uses, provide remediation and treatment consistent with regulatory requirements, restore the historic uh, capability of our well fields, provide for operational flexibility, and most importantly, uh, to the protection of our customers, the protection of public health. Next, please. We have four major projects. Um, which we've applied for Prop 1, and I'm going to go through each briefly. Next slide, please. I'm going to start with the North Hollywood West Wellhead Treatment Project. Um, and you can see the blue dots right above the leader for that item. That's, um, that's where we have a cluster of wells that have actually been shut down because of that plume of 1,4 dioxin. And the idea is we're going to turn those wells back on with the treatment in place uh, to park that plume and start removing mass. Next slide, please. 
And for this, we're using what we call best available technology. And because we have 1,4-deoxin present, we're using an advanced oxidation treatment process. We start out with pre-treatment, which is in essence is uh, filtration, followed by um, injection of hydrogen peroxide. Then you expose the water to ultraviolet light, UV light. And then um, following that with granular activated carbon again, mainly to quench the, the peroxide uh, from the water. And the other advantage of this treatment process is it also takes care of things like TCE and PCE as well, the other volatiles. And then at that point, it'll go into the, back into the well collector line and down to the North Hollywood pump station. And again, this one, this is this one we're moving ahead. We're implementing right now because, you know, the, it's it's really critical. We think to try to stop that point and do everything that we can. Next slide, please. Um, we completed our remedial investigation feasibility study for North Hollywood West in December of last year. Uh, the alternatives we looked at was do nothing, um, purchase alternative water supply, and really the best alternative our board when they you know, selected an alternative here was the pump and treat, which is what we're doing now. We actually started construction last month, and this is a photograph of basically preparing the site for that project. Next, please. Uh, now I'll talk about the Pollock uh, treatment, and this is also going to be a wellhead type treatment uh, process. And this well field is very important to us. It seems very small, but it's literally the last chance for us to grab our water rights from the San Fernando groundwater basin before they're lost to the Los Angeles River. Next slide, please. We've already been treating for uh, TCE, PCE, um, but now because we've actually lost, we've had to shut down a couple of the wells, but due to 1,4-dioxin, we have to add, again, an advanced oxidation process similar to what I described for North Hollywood West to keep this well field going. And then ultimately, we are concerned about the possibility of needing to treat for chromium down the line um, we're hoping not, but if so, we'd probably be looking at some sort of an ion exchange process uh, to do that. Next slide, please. Um, next, I'm going to talk about our North Hollywood Central Treatment Facility, and this would be looked at, or this would be located at our North Hollywood Pump Station site. I call it Groundwater Central because it's literally where the East Branch and West Branch of the North Hollywood Well Field come together, along with the Ronaldo Toluca Well Field, which is a, um, a major well field of ours. Next slide, please. And again, because there is 1,4-dioxane present, um, we need to, we're using an advanced oxidation process again, which will manage both the 1,4-dioxane as well as the uh, TCE, uh, PCE contamination. And this particular site, um, that we actually can peak at about 200 CFS, so it's a very large uh, production or groundwater producing site. And this pump station, uh, is where we inject that groundwater into our distribution system. And what we're looking at, um, you know, of course, subject to completing the feasibility study and, and investigation, is having very large centralized treatment facilities at the pump station site uh, that would be predominantly designed to deal with the Ronaldo Toluca well field so we could turn that well field back on. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'll talk about the Tahunga centralized treatment. And this one is kind of interesting. This is um, uh, the one that I mentioned where we've got sort of a knife blade of the 1,4-dioxane that's coming into the well field. And as such, we're going to have two types of treatment here. Next slide, please. Um, what, you know, the, because of the ability to control where, which contaminant is arriving at which set of wells, um, the wells that are subject to 1,4-dioxane will go through an advanced oxidation process, as I've been describing for the other well fields. But for the wells that have um, uh, TCE, PCE, or uh, carbon tetrachloride, we, will, um, we only need to run those through liquid phase GAC, which is similar to the demonstration project that we have out there now for those wells. Next slide, please. Um, as far as our next steps, um, we're hoping to get a contract out or an RFP out for a progressive design build for the large centralized uh, projects by the end of this year. Um, we've been working with um, the state on, uh, on a technical advisory committee, and we've been having TAC meetings, but we're literally imminently ready to sign an MOU 
which will formalize that process on, on how it's going to work, which is uh, very exciting. We've been working with the Division of Drinking Water for quite a number of years now on the 97005 permitting process, and that's key because that's all about making sure that the net result of this project, uh, which will be used as a drinking water source, will uh, be protective of public health. And we're continuing our evaluation of these treatment alternatives that I've described to you today. And through the course of all this, of course, we have uh, you know, an extensive public outreach effort to make sure that the communities are informed as to our progress. Um, as I mentioned, North Hollywood West, we've started construction. We're hoping to have that in place and operational by the end of 2019. We're continuing to do um, groundwater modeling to better delineate the plumes and design and, and assess the feasibility of these other projects. And finally, there's a lot of wells you may have noticed that I didn't talk about, kind of between the major well fields that are more to the north and the Pollock well field down in the south. I call those the neglected wells. Um, we would like to do further characterization of the aquifer in that area. And again, it's for operational flexibility as well as other opportunities to remediate contamination. And so that's sort of the next phase of all of this after these major projects I've described today are, are on course. Next slide, please. And of course, the question I get most often is how are we going to pay for all this stuff? Um, water rates is one avenue um, that will go towards these projects. Proposition one, we're really counting on having a, a huge, be a huge benefit as far as uh, funding for these projects. Uh, we have a legal team who has been engaged for quite a number of years of, um, in both identification of potentially responsible parties as well as pursuing cost recovery efforts. And then, of course, any other state or federal programs that we catch wind of that we might, we might be able to avail ourselves of, we would be uh, interested in doing so. Next slide, please. As far as the Prop 1, I think it was mentioned earlier, we have a preliminary award for the North Hollywood West project. The estimated cost of the project is about $92 million, and our preliminary implementation grant is $46 million. Uh, the North Hollywood Central project, that's our largest project. The estimated cost is about $300 million. We're hoping to get about $100 million for implementation. And we do have a preliminary award for planning grant of a million for that project. Uh, Tahunga Central, that's our next largest project with an estimated cost of about $140 million. And we have received a preliminary award for planning for a million dollars on that project as well. And finally, the Pollock project. Um, is estimated to cost almost $50 million. We're counting on about $22 million for implementation at some point. And we did also receive a preliminary award of a million dollars for planning on that project as well. Next slide, please. This is just sort of a, a timeline of where we've been and where we're going. In 2015, we retained the services of an owner's agent, in essence, experts to help us shepherd this program uh, through its completion. Um, as I mentioned, that we've got our first project going. The RI, FS, and CEQA was approved in the end of December. Started construction last month and hope to have this one operational by the end of 2019. We'd like to have the Pollock uh, response action operational by 2020. And finally, the Tahunga Central and North Hollywood Central response actions in place by 2021. And we're very anxious to try to maintain these schedules because you know, every year we wait, the plume keeps marching on. So the sooner we can get out there and get these things up and operating, the better. And that's, that's how we're looking at it at DWP. Next slide, please. Um, we have a lot of this information available on our website, um, ladwp.com slash remediation, including all of the intensely detailed reports and, and, and the whole works, if anyone is interested in that. Next slide. And that's it, unless there's questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions from board members? I have a question regarding water supply. So you said you've got your the uh, adjudicated rights uh, for the basin at 87,000 acre feet. So uh, what is currently in use? We've been we've probably been averaging somewhere around 50 to 60,000 acre feet of pumping a year. Um, a few years ago, we, it was kind of Russian roulette, I hate to say, but we were um, you know, in the middle of the drought and we 
increased our pumping and watched very carefully, uh, knowing that we might not be able to repeat it again because of the potential of pulling contamination into our wells. And we got lucky for that one year, and you know we did not lose any additional wells. So uh, it's last it's year, we hardly pumped anything because of the excess water coming from the mm -hmm. eastern Sierras. So at the 56 uh, or so on average, uh, that's sort of self-limiting, um, you know, because of these uh, movement of the plume issues? Yes, it's the contamination is the mm -hmm. primary reason why we're not pumping our rice. If we didn't have the contamination, again, the, you can see the San Fernando Basin is literally the centerpiece of our local water resource development. And if we didn't have the contamination, uh, we would be pumping our rights um, on average every year. And in some cases, um, you know, in cases of drought emergency or an earthquake that might take a, an aqueduct down, for example, we might actually pump a lot more um, pulling on stored water credits. And again, that's the other advantage of having, having the storage. So in the timeline that you have, that's really more implementation of the remediation uh, programs. Correct. Uh, as opposed to, you know, playing it out. So maybe that's in the next part of the discussion, but uh, if not, um, do you have uh, any sense based upon uh, modeling, you know, how, how do you see this playing out into the future, not just in terms of remediation, but also in terms of getting you to the place where you'd be able to take full advantage of your water rights? Well, we kind of look at it in two ways. Um, first, as soon as these remediation projects are in place, um, we'll be able to pump our rights. It's just that we have to treat the water on the way out. I kind of look at it, you've got your bank account, the ATM machine's broken right now, I can't make the withdrawal when the, the car needs repair, or the, the kid's college tuition is due. And uh, by having these projects in place, not only will they be remediating and removing mass, but because we can drink that water, we are able to pump our full rights. And so short term, once these are up and running, we will be able to move ahead with developing our local water resources with our full ability to operate these well fields and, and make those withdrawals from the bank, as it were, when we need to. Long term, that's something that we'll have to figure out initially with modeling and then followed, that, followed by monitoring over the long haul. Some of these projects may need to be operational for many, many decades before we've actually successfully removed all of the mass from the aquifer. Thank you. Is there a, an unmet modeling need at this point when it comes to at least characterizing the plumes and knowing what exactly it is, you know, our pumping actions are having uh, effect or having on it? Um, actually, I think our modeling capabilities are in pretty good shape. I and mean, one thing about the San Fernando Basin is it's probably one of the most studied groundwater basins that I know of. Uh, there's been so many monitoring wells drilled over the years and so much attention to the basin that there really is a lot of uh, geologic, hydrogeologic information that's gone into the groundwater models. So as far as that goes, I think our tools are, are very, actually in very good shape for doing this analysis. Um, I have a question. Uh, this is going back a ways for me as a you know, treatment engineer, but you know, TCE and PCE are notoriously sticky, to sort of very absorptive to the media in, you know, in, in the aquifer. And there's studies, you know, I remember early on in the Superfund program about in New Jersey, about you pumped out, treated, got down to non-detect for a PCE plume, and you let that uh, groundwater recharge, and then two years later you had the same concentrations of PCE in that aquifer. Um, it's so sticky, it, it, it takes a long time to pump and treat. So I'm familiar with some research at Stanford. Um, you know, the, one of those holy grails in engineering was can we get biology to do the heavy lifting? You know, nature, na natural enzyme-driven processes, the cellular level, to break those CCL bonds and make energy and, and, and dechlorinate those very difficult molecules. And there's been breakthroughs. Um, how, how much have, has this latest research, which is about five to seven years old now, been contemplated? Because clearly you've set forth, you can meet water supply goals by doing traditional pump and treat. But if we're really going to clean up this aquifer, we might need to use more unconventional methods, or at least 
do some pilot work and take advantage of this latest research, which is very promising. Has, have those discussions occurred? Uh, we've had a lot of discussions of alternative technologies and we're approached all the time by vendors with, you know, some new treatment process that they, you know, think we should look at. And I, and I think the key here is because of time, the interest of time, we are focusing on best available technology, which means, you know, what, what is going to be accepted by DDW, for example, today, uh, where there's enough assurance that the water we're ultimately going to serve to our customers um, is going to be safe. Um, however, uh, that doesn't mean we don't keep looking at opportunities in the future that may make our systems more efficient. One thing I've asked my engineers to do as we develop these facilities is to um, have them done in a modular fashion so that if new technologies and things come in, there's a way to change out. You know, if there's a better BAT in the future, we can plug that in, as well as the ability to um, have um, tests at these sites where you could plumb in a experimental treatment unit, for example, um, and try it out um, along with the, the mainstream treatment. So That's great. And, but also another aspect of this would be in-situ treatment, um, where you actually put organisms in the aquifer. Um, we, those, that would be a next step, a next level. Of, that's, uh, it's, that's an interesting one. We have not looked at that one, but it's certainly worth it. <laughs> and we, we did some one. of that when I was on the uh, staff at San Francisco Bay Regional Board. We allowed some of that experimental work at Moffett Field, and it was very uh, successful. And and so, one of the tricks here, especially with the TC and the PC, is the plume is so widespread already. Um, well, right, <laughs> and, and it's so true. And I, I respect that, but I also think, gee, it's so huge, we need to do something maybe unconventional here uh, if we're going to turn the corner in 50 years. You know? um, so anyway, I'm glad to hear that you're open-minded and making provisions for innovation. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, we, let's keep moving on, on this presentation. Thank you for the, the thorough preparation of that presentation. Thank you. Do I need to push the button? Yeah. There you go. Now you're on. There we go. Oh, oh wait a second. We're we'll pointing towards there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Point there. Goes. It's not going. Okay. Good morning. I'm Jeff O'Keefe. Um, I'm representing the Division of Drinking Water, and I'm going to explain. Um, our division's role in permitting these projects for potable use and ensuring that they're protective of public health and uh, provide a safe drinking water supply. I work um, locally in our Glendale field office and I've been working very closely with uh, the city on this project for a few years. Next slide, please. So this morning I'm going to explain um, a bill um, reference the 97005 permitting process. That refers to our division's policy, which is used to evaluate these projects to ensure um, they minimize any unknowns, that the sources are well characterized, that all chemicals are identified, and appropriate treatment technologies are selected. Um, we refer to that as the 97005 policy because it was developed in 1997 at a time when we were working with the city of Glendale on their um, other project in San Fernando Basin. It's called the Glendale Operable Unit. That system has um, extraction wells which are used for potable use with uh, extensive treatment and monitoring. So we developed the policy around that time frame, and uh, it's been in place for 20 years, and we've, we've approved several projects. I'll, I'll get into a little more detail on the, the other projects that we have approved. Um, so I'm going to um, provide the definition of what is an extremely impaired source, explain our permitting process um, for these projects in more detail, and then touch on the LA project. Uh, of course, Bill has ex has talked quite a bit about the LA project, so I, it's just a, a brief uh, mention of their projects. Next slide, please. So an extremely impaired source uh, meets two or more of the following criteria. Um, 
very high concentrations of, of chemicals with, with a, a drinking water standard or maximum contaminant level or notification level. So uh, oftentimes they're more than 10 times uh, the drinking water standard for the chronic uh, chemicals such as the volatile organics or more than three times a maximum contaminant level for acute chemicals such as nitrate or perchlorate. Um, they often contain a mixture of chemicals. You saw those contaminant plume diagrams from, from Bill with the 1,4-dioxane, the TCE, PCE, the chromium, et cetera. So they usually have some mixture of contaminants, often from multiple source areas. And they're extremely threatened with contamination due to proximity to known contaminating activities, such as the past uh, aerospace and other industrial industries that occurred in the San Fernando Basin. And the projects are often, they can either be existing wells, in some of which um, LA's project consists of existing wells, or they could be new wells that are drilled specifically to intercept uh, a contaminant plume. Next slide, please. So this cartoon is a real simplified uh, example of um, why we have a more stringent evaluation process for these projects. The extremely impaired sources have multiple chemicals present, much higher levels of contamination, and some uncertainty as to uh, peak concentrations, unknown chemicals that might not have been fully characterized through the CERCLA process. So we require um, for permitting a more extensive evaluation, um, more stringent treatment goals. So not just to meet a standard, but to, to meet the lowest level practical by the treatment technology. Uh, the projects would also require increased reliability, such as multiple barriers and process control, frequent monitoring. Um, yes, so more extensive monitoring also is very important to ensure ongoing that these projects produce a safe supply. Next slide, please. So these are the, the main elements of our evaluation, starting with the source water assessment, where you do a full inventory of, of practices that occurred within the basin and identify uh, source areas, chemicals of concern, and delineate a capture zone that the project will, will um, pull from. And then um, on the second step, the, the, and this is done in, typically done in a sequential order. Um, and each step informs the next step. The second step to characterize the raw water quality is to identify the design concentrations for all the chemicals of concern that the project is treating for. And the third step um, identifies the source protection measures. Typically, the projects would have, with the coordination of uh, regional board or EPA or uh, Department of Toxic Substance, Con Substance Control, have some uh, source area remediation element to them, um, such as a shallow, high concentration uh, treatment project or soil vapor extraction project to uh, address the highest level of the contamination in, in the contaminant plume. And uh, the goal of the upgrading and source protection measures is to minimize dependence on the project's treatment system in case of uh, treatment failure. This fourth step is um, basically the design step where uh, technologies would be selected. Um, Bill had mentioned best available technologies, proven technologies. Uh, also, uh, the monitoring requirements would be established in this step, uh, such as uh, this, the wellhead, the well 
monitoring and the process monitoring for the treatment process. Also, these projects typically also require upgradient monitoring um, from monitoring well networks to identify any changes in, in source water quality. And the fifth step is evaluating the health risk associated with a treatment failure. Um, you know, just as an example, we have permitted several of these projects, but, you know, whether it's um, a process failure or human error, um, things do occur. So these projects would typically require these multiple barriers, um, post-treatment blending, other uh, project features that would reduce the dependence on the treatment process itself and minimize any associated health risk. And then the last uh, step is, is uh, CEQA. Um, that's required for any drinking water project, um, not just these uh, uh, 9705 projects. Uh, there's a public participation step. It um, would follow the LA's own public participation, but we would have a public review and comment period and public meeting um, to ensure public acceptance of the project. And then based on all that, we would make a permitting dis decision and issue uh, the permit for use, for potable use. Next slide, please. Um, and on this, I thought I might just add, or for my colleagues, uh, Edification that uh, experimental aquifer cleanup technologies I was referring to really would apply more to the source protection measures. This isn't part of providing safe drinking water. You know, what Mr. O'Keefe is talking about is the proven technology to do that. And I was talking more about how do we get this aquifer cleaned up and the legacy. So thank you. But just to uh, comment on your comment, um, we haven't. We, we have been um, following the biological treatment processes for, for potable projects, and we did permit uh, one in the Rialto area, the West Valley Water District. Um, it's not without its challenges. There's mainly operational uh, control is an issue. We are kind of watching that. They are um, currently constructing a, a second process that may be more simplified in terms of uh, the operations. So we are watching that very closely. Oh, definitely. And we were happy to make sure you got the funding on that because uh, we were able to get Department of Defense funding uh, at the right. time. So uh, we're excited about that. And clearly there's biological treatment options for drinking water. I was dealing with, I was sort of focusing a little more on the legacy aquifer issues, but thank you for pointing that out. There's okay. still some treatment. Thank you. So. Um, Let's see. So we have um, permitted several of these projects, and they've operated successfully and have provided um, a beneficial use of the treated water for, for potable use and produce safe drinking water. And the projects that we've in permitted thus far have included the Glendale project I mentioned previously, um, several projects within the Baldwin Park operable unit area. The city of Pasadena, which had impacts from the Jet Propulsion Lab property. Uh, Santa Monica, which had some um, fuel oxygenate uh, contamination. Santa Clarita, which was impacted by um, a Whitaker Burmite site and had VOCs and perchlorate contamination up there. And in Riverside, there's several projects also. That, that's not the full list, but that's just a few examples. And we have several um, pending projects, including uh, LADWP's projects and um, some others within the county. Next slide, please. So um, LA has many extremely impaired sources within the San Fernando Basin well field. They include uh, three that um, were mentioned previously, the North Hollywood West, Rinaldi Toluca, Tahunga, Pollock, and one that wasn't mentioned um, was the North Hollywood operable unit. Um, that one um, 
will be going through a revised remedy and we're working with um, Los Angeles on that project and EPA. It's an EPA managed cleanup. And currently they have the air strippers, but it's going to be expanded with additional processes and additional um, wells. So we're, we're also quite busy on that. And um, just uh, the contaminants of concern that have been found within the basin include 1,4-dioxane and many regulated VOCs such as TCE and PCE. And uh, Chrome 6, which we currently don't have the MCL, but we're in the process of, of setting a new one. Um, that is also found within um, North Hollywood and, and uh, Glendale areas. Um, many sources have been offline because they can't meet the maximum contaminant levels and notification levels. Um, and we've been working with LA um, since 2012 when they initiated the ground, groundwater system improvement study, which, um, as Bill mentioned, is going to be used as a primary data set for the characterization that we need for the uh, uh, initial steps of the 9705 evaluation. And we meet monthly, um, seems like more than monthly, but I'm going to just say monthly, because um, there's different meetings for different projects and different teams of people. But we do have frequent meetings with um, not just LA, but also the other people at the table here. And um, several other agencies, as Sam's going to attest to, uh, is, are involved with the uh, um, remediation within the basin. And we are coordinating with them and sharing information and making sure um, information that we request all, also is what um, the other agencies need and that we're sharing and not duplicating effort. Next. So the key points. Um, the 9705 process enables us for a consistent staff review and evaluation to use an extremely impaired source. The goal is to minimize um, any surprises that could affect public health, uh, newly detected chemicals, um, increasing concentrations of chemicals, health effects or cumulative effect of exposure to multiple chemicals, um, and uh, uh, detecting um, treatment failures. Uh, the sequential process requires close coordination with the other agencies, and treatment goals are more stringent than our typical permitting requirement, and we require uh, less than maximum contaminant levels and notification levels including unregulated chemicals, um, including which is 1,4-dioxane uh, is unregulated currently, uh, to help protect the additive effects of exposure to multiple chemicals, contaminants. And I think that concludes my presentation. Questions? No? OK. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Moore, uh, Board Members Dodek, Diamato, and um, Esquivel. Um, for the record, I'm Sam Unger, the Executive Officer of the Los Angeles Regional Board. And on behalf of our Chair, our Board, um, and our staff, we welcome you to our region. And we are so pleased that you're and honored that you are considering these key issues that affect the Los Angeles region and the entire state here today. So as you know, uh, I, th I think both Bill and Jeff have said a lot of the things that I was planning on saying, but I'm going to try to fill some of the gaps if I can. Um, the matter before you today concerns impairments of water quality in groundwater basins of our region. Um, and why is this important? Next slide, please. Um, groundwater supplies a significant percentage of the drinking water for more than 10 million people in, in our region. And um, essentially what you see on this is some of the, the, the larger regions uh, the large and larger basins in our region, starting with San Fernando Valley and kind of moving around clockwise to the Raymond Basin, which Jeff talked about, uh, um, uh, limited contamination issue um, there with the, uh, uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab. The San Gabriel Valley, which actually has a fairly robust um, remediation program that is in place and has been in place for a number of years, using the same types of things that we're planning on uh, using at the San Fernando Valley, that is, pumping, treating, and then delivering for service. 
And then finally, you see the coastal plain of Los Angeles. Oftentimes, we see that it's, it's called the Central Basin, and it's broken up into the Central Basin and the West Coast Basin. Um, there again, uh, drinking water is produced from this area. Um, uh, a lot of contamination that uh, makes this area not uh, suitable for uh, uh, drinking water supply. Um, next slide, please. Um, I want to just uh, mention very quickly about the site cleanup program in the Los Angeles region. The site cleanup program is one of the largest programs in our region. The program consists of 33 case managers, that is staff, that are um, uh, geologists, uh, engineers, or scientists, who provide regulatory direction and oversight for contaminated sites that have been impacted or threatened to impact groundwater. Um, in addition um, to our expertise and our experience with um, uh, treating remediation sites, um, we also conduct uh, PRP searches, potentially responsible party uh, uh, um, uh, uh, searches, uh, oftentimes on behalf of the United States EPA. Um, in areas where uh, groundwater has been found, uh, we've investigated and identified dozens of PRPs in the San Fernando Basin. And I think uh, in both Bill's slides and in Jeff's slides, you see some of those other PRPs. The remediation is ongoing. And one of the key challenges that we will have, really, is to ensure that the uh, remediation that will be uh, funded under Prop 1 for LADWP does not interfere with the re ongoing remediations in some of these areas as well. Um, I wanted to take just a, a real brief moment here um, to just uh, touch on some of the questions that uh, Board Member Diamato and Esquivel um, said, talking about some of the uh, challenges and the technical challenges. You asked why some chemicals move faster than others and why in certain areas. Um, basically, the soil type, the permeability, the hydrostratigraphic discontinuities, that is, the underground little channels of air and things like that, the contaminant con um, chemistry, and any pumping and reinjection can essentially all affect the movement of contaminants. And it's really uh, uh, quite a job to uh, um, uh, manage that complexity in a coherent manner. And uh, hence the question about modeling. And um, unfortunately, I would like to say that um, uh, you know, we, we have robust modeling on all our cleanup sites, but it's something new that we are pursuing right now. The State Board has been kind enough to approve our uh, uh, request to purchase um, uh, groundwater models, specifically the same model that um, Department of Water and Power will be using um, on, the, uh, on these projects. And we have several staff that are coming up to speed, and Paula is um, trying to identify other staff and uh, take the time and, and account for the time that it's you know, going to take to bring them up to speed as well. So we feel comfortable in that area. But in general, um, I would say that uh, typically, in mo most typical cases, we rely on consultants uh, modeling. And uh, so here we're, we're taking a different approach, and we really appreciate the support from State Board on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide uh, shows the groundwater plumes, and I'm happy to say that you do see two different plumes on this slide. Um, you'll see a dioxane plume, which is in the very light purple um, in, in some areas. Uh, again, and then you see the VOCs, the chlorinated VOCs um, um, in the uh, pink in the uh, San Fernando Basin. Um, I also wanted to put up there that the green squares indicate sites that are under active oversight by the, remedi by, the remi uh, by the regional board. And by active oversight, really, I don't mean necessarily that they're all into remediation, but certainly they've been identified in, in site characterization, which is the first step before uh, a remediation comes into play, is ongoing in these sites. Um, the purple dots are, um, are, are show areas where, let me see them here. Um, It doesn't show too clearly, but the purple dots show wells that are being traded by US EPA under their Superfund remedies. Um, and EPA has not identified responsible parties in the area uh, that are proposed for Prop 1 funding, and hence the need for this funding, in addition to all the other needs that have gone on, that uh, Bill has so eloquently said. Um, the red dots, maybe it's on the next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. So there's the purple and the red. So, um, so the red dots um, are well fields that have been addressed um, 
and will be addressed by LADWP um, 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 funding. Um, next slide, please. Um, for the regional board, and I think for the state board as well, um, our, our key priorities are effective source control at cleanup sites, um, as you said. So that is we want to remove mass um, from the most heavily contaminated areas, whether it's in a drinking water area or not, because that will provide those contaminants uh, for decades, if not centuries, to come. So we want to have effective source control. We want to spread the con uh, uh, contamination, and as you will see, uh, we've done some work with the modeling that show that just by the fact of remediating through a pump and treat system, you can affect the spread of contamination, and that is what we are interested in monitoring and uh, avoiding in these Prop 1 uh, projects. And of course, ultimately, to restore the beneficial use and provide safe drinking water to uh, the residents here in Los Angeles. Next slide, please. I just, real quickly, I just wanted to uh, do a bit of an animation if we think we can handle it. Um, um, meaning, uh, thank you so much. And really what that does is that that's a depiction of a plume spread, basically, is what it is meant to, to show. And essentially, this is what can happen um, uh, under the, uh, uh, the large pumping regimes that could uh, uh, manifest this uh, activity. We're trying to control this. We're trying to understand it. We're trying to make sure that it doesn't happen. And if it does happen, we have the right remedies in place before it happens. And uh, we're, we're caught chasing these plumes. Um, the, the, the drastic change in hydraulic conditions due to the pumping will make it um, a challenge to control. But again, I think with the modeling, um, with the technical advisory committee and things like that, we can stay in front of this. Um, next slide, please. Stronger, is it? Um, not assigning blame or anything, but that, could that explain why it's such a regional sized plume in the first place? It's just, you, you know, I, I we were paying attention to these type of things that move in water I, around. I, I don't really actually think that's the case. I really, um, <laughs> I, I mean, it may, it, it may have contributed to the case, but my opinion is, is basically that this area was so industrialized and, and actually, as we're finding now, as we go to other areas in the San Fernando Valley, Waste management practices at that time were just to essentially take spent solvent and dump them out in the soil on your property. And I, you know, I, I think, I mean, I think that there is um, possibly some spreading. I mean, most of the remediations that we have are of smaller scale, but I really just think it's the incredible mass of contaminants that were um, disposed uh, before uh, essentially we knew how to handle them in a more. Uh, like when you dump out the last coffee in your cup, you know. Yeah, what, what do you get? You get a lot of concentrated coffee. Caffeine plumes. Right. Remember that this is now um, 70 years since um, a lot of these solvents were done. Groundwater moves and it carries up stuff with it as it moves. So that's yes. part of that spring. That's true as well. Um, so again, the item before you today concerns just information regarding an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and uh, to set forth a formal technical advisory committee as we move forward with these uh, Prop 1 projects. Um, it, it is anticipated that the, uh, uh, the parties um, to these technical advisory meetings would include uh, uh, State Board staff, Division of Drinking Water, uh, LADWP, and Regional Board staff. We have some of our staff here who have been coming up to speed on this uh, very quickly and very effectively and have contributed quite a bit. And so I want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Jeffrey Hu and, and Chrissy Humphreys um, who are here. And um, um, Paula has done a great job in making sure that they are spending their time appropriately in supporting these activities. So. Um, Again, the purpose of this instrument is to assist both LADWP and the water boards manage a very complex subject, and that com complex subject is plume migration under the proposed pumping regime that, uh, that these projects will uh, impose. Um, we, we, we have entered, I think we've, we haven't quite entered into it yet. I think it's, uh, John may tell us that it's almost ready to be signed. I'm, I'm waiting for his email and he tells me I may have missed it, but the, that uh, we're very close to signing the MOU and uh, uh, moving forward. I, I will let you know that I have discussed this uh, issue with the regional board in the executive officer reports and uh, they are very, uh, in an informal manner, they've uh, provided uh, a lot of encouraging words to uh, em embark on this process of a technical advisory committee and an MOU. And so with that, I think um, I've, that's about all I have to say. Okay. Um, 
final, um, yeah, final, final slide here is just uh, we'll we, we believe the MOU um, is for a project that will require ongoing coordination. It's necessary due to the complexity, and uh, we will sure that, ensure that the state's monies are well spent on these projects. And I just wanted to chime in and thank the folks here on the panel and others in their respective agencies for their help over the last couple of years in formulating this process. And um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Cosby and Mr. Unger, thank you and your staff and of course Mr. Van Wagener and our DBW staff and um, Leslie for queuing things up. Um, I'm very pleased to see our, within our agency the coordination and uh, I was wondering if um, you had anything to say about you know the other agencies too as part of this coordination such as DTSC and um, EPA um, you know what's their role and how are they dialed in? You may want to turn that over to Bill in, in terms of uh, US EPA I certainly they're very aware of this I'm not sure exactly if we have much DTSC presence on this Jeffrey do you do you know of any? Okay, not quite involved, but, but yeah. And they are involved in some of our other Prop 1 projects and will be part of the TAC even on some of the other projects we're working on. Right, yeah, no, I, I get it. It's, it's DTS, I, will, I would like to clarify that the DTSC is involved in some other smaller scale remediations in the San Fernando Valley. That's great, for, for they have them on the team, yeah. their expertise. And, right. That's great. Okay, super, any other uh, questions? I, I have one more, and this is just taking us off into another track and entirely, but just uh, the, the role that um, groundwater recharge plays um, with all of this. And I know you're, you're here today to talk about remediation, and we're running out of time, but just, you know, any thoughts on um, uh, the role that it plays, uh, particularly in terms of uh, any... Uh, uh, integrated processes that are uh, underway with respect to recharge projects and how that fits in with what you're looking at on remediation and uh, monitoring. Um, yeah, yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, and actually the spreading grounds have been in operation for many decades, so it's an existing facility, but we are going through processes to try to see them improve so that you can increase the capacity or in some cases restore the capacity that was there once before. And um, you know, I think we've seen one thing about this is because of hydrologic cycles, you do see some rather extreme exercising in the basin itself. Uh, during extended dry periods, you'll see not much water going into the basin. You'll see the levels um, drop. And then in times like last year, you know, where you have a lot of precipitation, you'll see everything rise back up. So when you're doing modeling, you have to sort of assume dry and wet periods and model those to see what kind of response you get. But I think the, really the key in the end is you have to do the monitoring afterwards to see how close your, your modeling came. And so we're not necessarily looking at, um, um, you know, at the spreading grounds themselves. There, there'll be some increases in, in ability to spread water, but there's also limitations in some of those facilities as well, um, such as nearby landfills and things like that that, you know, so there are limits, but, um, so I don't know that it, you're gonna see big changes in how things operate. You're just gonna be able to operate them more is, is the hope. Um, also, there's a lot of local um, projects where we're looking at localized stormwater capture as well to sort of reverse the effects of urbanization as it were. You know, any, any on-site, um, especially in the eastern San Fernando Valley, it's a great example, you know, any on-site capture um, on individual properties and things that we can get rain, into the ground on a large scale. Rain, rain gardens that private property owners yes. put in, whether businesses or residences. And, and I would just say in some of our other projects outside of uh, this area, the, the ones of, if you will, the uh, isolated cases, uh, were, uh, Remediation systems do include uh, recharge. It's part of our monitoring program to uh, uh, look at that area of the aquifer in the near vicinity of the recharge. So that's part of our common. Yeah, one, one thing I didn't mention too is the, the, the as far as recycled, Jeff is reminding me, as far as recharging recycled water, typically that's gonna happen when you don't have stormwater available. In general, it's LA County that operates our spreading grounds and um, they put a precedent on stormwater. So again, during the drier periods, that's when you can optimize 
uh, you're actually able to use the spreading grounds where you wouldn't be using them otherwise and getting more water into the aquifer. Portfolio. I was going to mention that we are funding the spreading grounds through our Prop 1 stormwater program, and so it, we do look at these, you know, on all the sites as far as sometimes the source control, whether you can re-inject the water upgrading, you know, and, and help to reduce that source area. We look at it through the stormwater program and through also our site cleanup subaccount programs, sometimes on a smaller level. This is just such a large-scale, huge um, project that you can see all the moving pieces, which is why we wanted to present this to you. It's really looking at, you know, using these supply wells as remediation wells where they're capturing the plume and keeping it from migrating, but then again trying to operate them so they're not pulling other plumes in. So, you know, that whole balance as to how they pump, how they use their water rights, how all of these cleanups uh, happen, and how the stormwater projects go together. is It's a really complex project. That's right. You know, we'll learn also through the enhancement of stormwater infiltration and the monitoring networks that Sam and, and others are, and, and DWP have, we'll get a better sense of sort of a signal to noise. You know, will stormwater infiltration really affect contaminant movement or not and recharge areas, you know, and that sort of thing. So I think this is one of those things of more information, the better, you know, within the budgets that are allowed. But we have to keep an eye on these things so we can answer these questions. These are good questions. Will more stormwater infiltration have an effect on these efforts to clean up the basin? Or maybe it'll help clean up the basin. And let's keep our minds open. And the complexity is such that you know this MOU and these agreements are, are necessary. You have to have this coordination. And so you know, thank you all for, for the work on this. And it's really incredible to see such a diverse uh, you know, grouping of, of folks, but, you know, coming together and saying, well, let's coordinate because, again, uh, to your point, the complexity of the migration of these plumes, our activities are such that we, we have to, we all have to be on the same page, if you will. And, you know, it's particularly exciting, I think, for me, seeing that, you know, the division of drinking water and the regional board also really kind of coming together here, uh, you know, an outgrowth, again, of us uh, having the drinking water program over now is, you know, this more easily facilitated, you know, discussion, we're all, we're all part of uh, sort of one, one umbrella agency here. And so these, um, uh, these, these benefits are, are fantastic. So thank you. Good work. Thank you. Great comments. We didn't have any blue cards on this item, I take it. No, no comments from the audience. So I believe we can move on. Thank you very much for that informative panel. And then we're going to do a time check now. It's a quarter to 12. There's a window for lunch for those who are here visiting uh, to have to get to the cafeteria by 1.30 or 1. And the projected time for the uh, item 6, the salt and sea item, exceeds that window. So I'm going to look at my fellow board members and see if we're going to take a break now for lunch. Um, short. Do you want to do a shorter break, like a 30-minute or 45-minute? 40, 45? 45. So can we, we'll do a we'll break for 45 minutes. That brings us back at uh, it looks like 12:30 according to that clock. So we'll reconvene the meeting. We're gonna break and we'll reconvene at 12:30 for item six about the Salton Sea. Sound good? See you at 12:30. And since